So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 15. This will be the primary text this morning. Uh, when Jesus appeared to the disciples, doubting Thomas wasn't with them. And Thomas says, I'm not going to believe unless I can stick my finger in the holes in his hands and put my hand in the hole in his side where the spear went in when he died on the cross. And he wasn't with them when Jesus first appeared. And so eight days later, Jesus shows up and says, okay, Thomas, here I am, you know, Put your uh, finger in the hole of my hand. Put your hand in the hole of my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believing. And, you know, Thomas was blown away, and he says, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. And that's for all of us, because I've never seen the Lord, but we put our faith and trust in him. very next thing it says there in John 20, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And that's what it all boils down to, having the eternal life in Christ. And if you do not have eternal life in Christ, then I don't know what you're doing. I don't know where you expect to be going Um there's eternal damnation or there's eternal life, and eternal life sounds much better by any stretch of the imagination. So in 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to read through some of these verses and see what the Lord has for us. He says, Moreover, brethren, this is the Apostle Paul writing, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, <clears throat> which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So this is the gospel, the good news. And he says, you know, you didn't believe this in vain. You hold fast to these things. You believe these things. And Paul says, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. There's many Old Testament scriptures, Isaiah 53 comes to mind, Psalm 22 comes to mind, where Jesus died on that cross for our sins, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. From Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11, we know that Jesus would not stay in the grave, but he would rise up victoriously. These things were prophesied about many years earlier. And then he says, And that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and then by the twelve. The climax to all four Gospels is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His appearing to various individuals and groups of people over a 40-day period demonstrated that he was alive, risen from the dead. So on that first uh, resurrection Sunday morning, he appeared to Mary Magdalene and then some of the other women and then to the disciples later that day. And then over the next 40 days, he appeared to many disciples. And at one point, it says he appeared to over 500 brethren at one time. But it mentions here Cephas, or Peter, uh, first of all. He appeared to Cephas, or Peter. We're not sure exactly when that was. We know later on he would uh, restore Peter, because re Peter re uh, denied him three times. And then the rooster crowed, and Peter went away weeping. And then later on... Uh, just before the ascension, Jesus meets him up at Sea of Galilee and says, Peter, do you love me? Well, Lord, you know I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. You know, tend my lambs. Feed my sheep. Three times he restores him. But then at some point right after the resurrection, he appeared to Peter. Now, in Luke 24, verse 34, it says, The Lord is risen indeed. This is what the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, when they run back and see the twelve, he says, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. That's Peter. And then after Paul mentions Peter, he then mentions that he was seen by the twelve here in verse 5. Minus Judas Iscariot. You know, he was long gone at this point. Now we know that they were hiding in fear in the house when Jesus came to them. And they were trembling. They did not believe the resurrection, even though the women had been saying, he's alive, the angels told us, he's risen from the grave. And yet they were trembling in fear. And yet he appeared to them later that evening. 
Look at verse 6. It says, After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So I love this verse because it mentions 500 brethren being together, seeing the risen Lord and Savior. Acts chapter 1 mentions that Jesus appeared to various groups during that 40-day period between his resurrection and his ascension. We don't know exactly when or how he appeared to the 500, but at one point, 500 people saw him alive, risen from the dead. Now, this is significant because Paul's point here is, hey, if you don't believe my account of the resurrection, there are, and this is about 20 years later, there's probably still 400 of these people still alive. Go ask them. They'll tell you, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead. We saw him. They'll confirm this to you. Now, I can guarantee that all those people that were still alive some 20 years later were still holding fast to the fact that he was alive, that he had conquered the grave, because that truth had taken root in their hearts, and they were able to live out their lives with great hope, with great peace, with great joy, even though many times they would go through tremendous hardships and trials. The only reason we can get through difficult times today is because we know Jesus is with us. He won't leave us. He won't forsake us. He'll be there with us every step of the way. He will heal broken hearts. He'll open blind eyes. He'll set at liberty those who are oppressed. So whatever you're going through, if you know the risen Lord and Savior today, He will give you comfort. He will give you peace. He will do whatever you need Him to do to get you through it. For these early disciples they would know very quickly they needed the risen Lord and Savior being with them all the time. Because within the first 250 years of the church being born, 6 million Christians would be put to death simply because they were followers of Jesus Christ. And they weren't going to deny the Lord. They were going to stand up for the Lord no matter what. And I can only imagine what impact you know, seeing Jesus risen from the dead had upon their lives. But Paul's point to these Corinthian Christians was simply this. Don't ever doubt the fact and the reality of the resurrection of Christ. There's more proof, there's more evidence that Jesus is risen from the grave than almost anything else in human history. Non-believers wrote about Jesus. Josephus wrote about Jesus, the things that he did, the things that he said how he was put to death, how some claimed he rose from the dead. So the reality of the resurrection will see you through so many different trials and struggles in this life. Now look at verse 7 here in 1 Corinthians 15. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. So he first mentions James. Now who is James here? This is not the apostle James, you know, Peter, James, and John and Andrew, this is not that particular James, this would be the Lord's half-brother. After Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, and he was born of the Virgin Mary, Mary and Joseph had at least six other children after that, and they would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In When Jesus was in Nazareth, and he was blowing the minds of the people there, with his teachings and his miracles, they questioned him, they doubted him. They, they knew Jesus growing up in Nazareth. They knew that his family was there among them. They saw Jesus as a little boy raised up among them, and they had doubts about Jesus when he started to claim that he was the Messiah, when he was doing all these miraculous things. And so we read this in Matthew 13, verse 55. It says, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, notice, James, that's who's referred to here, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And it goes on to say that they were offended by Jesus. But here Paul mentions his half-brother, James, Jesus' half-brother. Why does Paul bring up James? Because when Jesus began his earthly ministry and it became apparent that Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, he's doing all these miraculous signs and wonders, 
James actually thought that his older brother went off the deep end. And they went to Jesus to try to rescue him. They thought he had this messianic complex. And so we read this in John chapter 7, verse 5. For even his brothers did not believe in him. And so that all changed right here when Jesus rose from the dead. He appears to Simon Peter and the twelve. And he also appears to his half-brother James. And from that point on, James' life was radically changed. He wrote the book of James. He would become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. James was the one that made the decision there in, in Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. James was overseeing the church at that time. In Galatians 1.19, Paul refers to James and as, as an apostle and as the Lord's brother. So James was totally changed by the resurrection of Christ. That's the kind of impact the resurrection of Jesus should have on all of our lives. He should radically change us. If he is alive, risen from the dead, and he's dwelling inside of us, the King of kings and Lord of lords, you cannot be passive about Jesus. You're either for him or you're against him. But he has turned us into new creations. How could we be indifferent to the things of God if he is dwelling inside of us? So think about that. Verse 8 says, Then last of all, Paul says, Last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Paul is referring to the fact that he's not like the other apostles. He's not like Peter, James, John, Andrew, Thomas. Those guys lived with Jesus, they ministered with Jesus, they ate with Jesus, they slept together out in the fields for three and a half years. What was Paul during, doing that, during that time? Well, Paul was known as Saul of Tarsus. He was going through this rabbinical school led by Gamaliel. When Paul started seeing these so-called wayward Jews going after this false messiah named Jesus of Nazareth, Paul took it upon himself to try to stamp them out. He was trying to destroy these early followers of Jesus. He thought they were crazy. He didn't believe them at all. So he was like an antichrist towards Jesus Christ and his followers. So that all radically changed, as you know, when the Apostle Paul met the Lord face to face, and Jesus kind of knocked him off his high horse, so to speak. We're going to look at some verses here in Acts 26, starting in verse 9. This is where Paul, known as Saul of Tarsus, now he's the Apostle Paul, everywhere he went, he would give his testimony of how Jesus radically saved him. He was a, a rebellion against Christ. He was in rebellion against the Lord. He hated Christians, these Jews that were following Jesus. And so this is his account of what happened says in verse 9, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints, speaking of these Jewish Christians, I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. You think you've done things contrary to the Lord, You've, you've said bad things. You've done wrong things. Think about Saul of Tarsus. I've never voted to put a Christian to death. I never had a Christian locked up and put in prison. I didn't try to destroy families. That's what Paul was doing before Jesus got a hold of him. So he says in verse 11, And I punished them often and in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, so he's got official papers in hand, he's going to Damascus in Syria, he's going to arrest these wayward Jews, bring them back, and if they don't turn back to Judaism, if they don't reject Jesus, he's going to have them put to death. That's his goal, that's what's on his mind. And he's going there, and it says, At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me, and those who journeyed with me. 
And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. This is why Paul says here, He was seen, last of all, by me, one born out of due time, and so Jesus appears to him. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. Then Jesus gives him his marching orders, so to speak. But rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. That is what he says to each and every one of us who are followers of Christ. He has a ministry for us to be a husband, to be a father, to be a wife, to be a mother, to be a godly grandparent. He's given each one of us a purpose. So I've appeared to you for this purpose. Why do you think there's so much turmoil in our nation today? And so many young people don't even know what sex they are because they have no purpose. They have no meaning. Why do you see all these fringe groups out there going out after Christians now? and going into schools and shooting up Christian schools because they have no meaning and no purpose. That's only given to us by the Lord himself. And if we reject him, then you're, you know, in Satan's clutches. You reject the Lord, you're going to end up doing all kinds of crazy things. I did crazy things before I got saved. Not as crazy as some things today, but it's not a sliding scale. We are all guilty before God. We all deserve the wrath of God. But he says he appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you've seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. When I got saved, I had no idea I was going to be a pastor. This is the last thing I wanted to do. I wanted to play baseball. I wanted to surf. That was it. And God's got other plans for all of us. You have to yield to him and he'll reveal himself to you over time. He says, I will deliver you from the Jewish people, because Paul will now be hated by his fellow Jews, because now he's speaking about Jesus, as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. And this is the purpose he sent Paul, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We have an inheritance, which is heaven. That's where we're going when we die, if we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. He wants us to preach the gospel because that's the power of God unto salvation to anyone who will believe. To everyone who will receive Christ, he'll set them free. He'll give them meaning and purpose. He'll set them free from the clutches of Satan. So Paul, you know, he saw himself as the most unlikely, unworthy person to have seen the risen Lord. And because of his horrible treatment of those who followed after Jesus, Paul says, I'm the least of the apostles. He says, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Paul was number one on the top ten list of those who were most unlikely to be saved. And, and I was the same way before I got saved. Nobody would ever think I would become a Christian, and yet God's grace is amazing. So Paul definitely knew what he deserved because of the brutal things that he did against God's people, but now Paul shines the spotlight directly upon the turning point in his life this is the turning point in all of our lives. It's simply the grace of God. This is what it's all about. Look at verse 10 here in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Sounds like Popeye. I am what I am. Yuck, 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 yuck. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. So when Jesus came into Paul's life on that road to Damascus, he was a radically changed person. 
He went from death to life. He went from darkness to light. He went from being this angry, bitter person to being filled with the Holy Spirit. He's now cleansed. He's forgiven of all of his sins. And now he's filled with the love of Jesus. And his whole life took on new meaning and new purpose. He had a plan and direction for his life. No longer was he going to seek to destroy people. Now he wanted to see people restored. And that's the purpose he's given us. We don't want to see people destroyed. I, my heart breaks when I see all these young people doing all these crazy things to their bodies, knowing this is not the answer. You're still going to be miserable. Only a changed heart will change you. And only Jesus can change your heart. Not your outward appearance. Not you know defaming your body. Not doing any of these things. Only Jesus Christ can give us true meaning and purpose to life. And here Paul gives all the credit for the changes in his life to the grace of God. And that's what we all need to do. Thank the Lord for his grace. Because without God's grace, we would all be toast. Burnt toast. Paul knew all these glorious changes in his life, not because of anything he did, but he saw the reality of Jesus Christ working in him, working through him. And if someone was to ask Paul, why you, Paul? You were so contrary to the things of God. You were so contrary to Jesus Christ. Why would God save somebody like you? Paul's response would be along the lines of, I'm simply an example of God's grace. If God can save somebody like me, the worst of sinners, then he can save anybody. How do we know that was his line of thinking? Because he tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, I could raise my hand to that one, a persecutor, I picked on a lot of Christians before I got saved, an insolent man, violently arrogant is what that means, and that's how I was. I mean, I was a pitcher at San Diego State, and I'd literally throw the ball at guys' heads just to try to tick them off and challenge them to fight. Fortunately, I had a bigger catcher that would grab them before they beat me up. But I was a jerk. I mean, it was just crazy. A violently arrogant man. But I obtained mercy, Paul says, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, notice, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering or patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I mean, can you see how awesome and powerful God's grace is? He said, I'm the pattern. Again, if God can save somebody like me, Paul says, he can save anybody. So don't ever think, well, this sin I've committed how could God ever forgive that? Or I've done this to people, how could God ever forgive that? God's bigger than any sin you could ever commit. God is bigger than any problem you have. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to come to Him and realize how much He loves us, and it's by His grace we are saved. If God could love and save and then use someone like the you know Saul of Tarsus and then turn him into the Apostle Paul then there is nothing that God cannot do to cleanse us, to forgive us, and then to use us for his glory. Paul says, and I can say, and most of you in here can say, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. So who are you in Christ today? If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, let me just quote some verses. I'm not even going to give you the verses. just going to go through these quickly. But this is what the Bible says, who you are in Jesus. The Bible says we are saved forever by His grace. We are forgiven of all of our sins. The Bible says we are accepted by Christ and beloved by God. The Bible says we are new creations in Christ, dead to sin, 
and alive to God. The Bible says we are clothed with the very righteousness of Jesus. We are born again. We are children of our Heavenly Father. The Bible says we are children of promise, and thus we are joint heirs with Jesus. The Bible says we have become partakers of the divine nature. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says we are vessels of honor who are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. The Bible says we are citizens of heaven. We are a royal priesthood. We are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The Bible says we are fishers of men, ministers of reconciliation, and ambassadors for Christ. And all those things, and that's just the tip of the proverbial iceberg of what the Bible says, hundreds of promises God has given to us simply because we are saved by His grace. And so if God can save somebody like me, and I know some of you, and if He can save somebody like you, He can save anybody. That's why Paul was able to say, by God's grace, I am what I am. So in these first 11 verses here, Paul has shown us what the gospel of Christ is. He's shown us the power of the gospel. This is what the power of the gospel can do. Change anyone and mold you and shape you into the person God wants you to be. He's done everything for our salvation. Verse 11 says, Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Verse 12, Now if Christ is preached, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. There were some in the Corinthian church, because of their Greek background, they thought anything physical was evil. And so Jesus could not have risen bodily from the grave. He would have a body that would make that evil. And they had a wrong perception. They thought everything spiritual was good. Everything physical was evil. Is that true? No. When God created this world, he, at the end of creating, after the six days, he says, it is very good. Sin has corrupted this world. But everything spiritual is certainly not good. We live in a spiritual world. There's a demonic forces all around us. Satan and his Little henchmen are doing all they can to try to steal, kill, and destroy. So not everything spiritual is good as well. Paul makes it very clear, though. Jesus rose up physically from the dead. Remember when Jesus said to the Jews on the Temple Mount, these verses, John 2, 19 and 22, Jesus answered and said to them, and this is the sign he was giving them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, they did not immediately believe the scripture and the words that Jesus said, because again, they doubted. Jesus appeared to the disciples, and they were hiding in fear. We're told in Luke 24, verses 38 and 39, Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled? You know, why are you hiding in fear? Why do you doubts arise in your hearts about the fact that he's alive, risen from the dead? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Again, Jesus rose bodily from the grave. Paul's point is the bodily resurrection is very important. For one thing, it validates the Word of God. The Word says He would rise bodily, and He did. But also the bodily resurrection proves to us that the physical world around us is not all evil in and of itself, but there is discernment that we need. You look around the world and you have to have discernment that comes from the Holy Spirit. Is this good or is this bad? Should I reach for this or should I leave that alone? Should I go this direction or that direction? The Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us by the truth of God's Word. We need to have wisdom and discernment as we live in this broken, sinful, fallen world. 
Satan is a liar. He's the father of lies, and we need to be careful. So the question is not, is it spiritual or physical? The question should be, is it biblical or is it anti-Bible? Is what they say line up with the word of God, or is it just the philosophies of men? Paul says in verse 14, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. In other words, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then everything I'm saying this morning is empty. Everything Paul says is vain. We're false witnesses of God by telling you God raises the dead, but if he didn't, then we're just lying. Look at verse 16. Paul goes on to say, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is is futile or it's worthless for you are still in your sins in other words if there is no resurrection that means jesus did not rise from the dead and if jesus doesn't rise from the dead he is a liar because he said over and over again i'm going to jerusalem i'm going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men i'm going to be crucified but i'm going to rise up from the dead on the third day true or false he said that it was true. So Paul's saying if it didn't happen, then Jesus is a liar. If Jesus is defeated by death, then his own death upon the cross was meaningless. That means the blood that he shed on the cross would not pay for any sin. All those animals that were sacrificed for thousands of years under Judaism were a temporary covering for sin. It can never take away your sin. It can never wash you clean. That's why they had sacrifice after sacrifice, year after year. That's why Hebrews says Jesus died once and for all for our sins. His perfect spotless blood will wash away, cleanse anyone, no matter what you've done. But if it's true that Jesus didn't pay the price for my sins, then I'm still a lost sinner who has zero hope of going to heaven. And if that's the case, look at verse 18. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ, those who have died as Christians, have perished. It means they have been lost forever. No hope. They're simply food for the worms. That's his point. Verse 19, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable that's the logical conclusion that Paul gives. If there is no victory over death, if there is no future life with God in glory, if this world is all there is, then we might as well think, let's just go out and party. Let's go out and do whatever we want to do. This is all there is to life. Go for the gusto. doesn't get any better than this. You can look at all the beer commercial ads. That's what they're all about. Let's just eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die if there's no hope of eternal life. This whole Christian life is a miserable joke unless Jesus conquered the grave. But as Paul will now show us, because Jesus did conquer death and hell and sin, we have what the Bible calls a living hope. We have a blessed hope. We're looking forward to the day when we leave these bodies of flesh behind and we get caught up into the presence of of the Lord. It's because Jesus is alive that we know that we're going to be raised up to newness of life. Look at verse 20. Paul writes, but now Christ is risen from the dead. I like how matter of fact Paul puts it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Paul knew beyond a shadow of a doubt Jesus is alive. He appeared to me. He knocked me off my high horse. He spoke to me. I know he's alive. And this was a few years after the disciples. There wasn't any question about it in Paul's mind. So he's already made his case in the first part of this chapter. Jesus was seen by 500. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared to me. I know it's true. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This day is also known as the day of the first fruits, the resurrection day. 
For since by man came death, speaking of Adam, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so ever since Adam and Eve sinned, death has been brought into this world and everything dies. Guaranteed. Taxes and death. Two things that are guaranteed in this life. And we will all die because we are all in Adam. But then he says, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Glorious. Paul saw and heard the risen Savior on the road to Damascus. Paul was so radically changed by the love and grace of God. There was zero doubt in Paul's mind concerning the fact that Jesus was alive, risen from the dead. And I can make that same fact. I have zero doubt about Jesus being raised from the dead. Not just archaeologically even though there's so much archaeological evidence, not just historically, because again, so many people, even non-Christians, wrote about Jesus. Not just prophetically, but that's one of the great evidences. We have all these prophecies in the Bible, 300 prophecies about Jesus' first coming, and Jesus fulfilled them all perfectly. There's about 300 prophecies concerning His second coming. And by the way, next Sunday, Lord willing, if we're still here, we're talking about the second coming of Christ, the second half of Revelation 19, Jesus will fulfill every one of those prophecies, I believe, perfectly. We have His Word on it. We have fulfilled prophecy. We have fulfilled archaeological evidence. I mean, they're digging up stuff constantly in Israel that proves the fact that the Bible is true. For me, I, that stuff is great, but I got a changed heart. I mean, I was brutal. I was wicked. I would use the Lord's name in vain constantly. I did horrible things before I got saved. He came into my life when I was miserable, when I was depressed. I was as low as I could ever be. But that night, it was a Wednesday night, November 30th, 1977, Jesus came into my heart and he washed me clean. When I went forward to receive the Lord, it felt like this huge weight of sin, guilt, shame just lifted off. And I never had any doubt whatsoever because He flooded my soul with love, with joy, with peace. I now had a new fellowship, a new relationship with the Creator of the universe. I've been searching in all kinds of different things, in relationships, in drugs, alcohol, sports, I mean, trying to find meaning and purpose. Nothing would ever satisfy until Jesus Christ came into my life. He's done, you know, so much more for me than anything this world could ever do. He saved me in every way a person can be saved. He delivered me from a self-destructive self and from the devil and from death and from eternal damnation. You know, men and women, I hope you know that Jesus loves you. I mean, I hope He's that real to you because He's that real to me. I know where I'm going when I die. I don't fear death. I don't look forward to the process. You know, I've always, you know, being a surfer, it's like, Lord, I don't, you know, after I got saved and I was still surfing, I'm like, I really don't want to go by being eaten by a shark. That'd be kind of horrible. But, you know, God's in control of those things. But I don't fear death because I know where I'm going when I die. I trust Him more than I trust anybody. Only He can say, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Only Jesus can say, I'll never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. People come and go, but Jesus Christ will never leave you or forsake you. Only Jesus can say, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, you're burdened down. He says, come to me and I'll give you rest. You're not going to find that in this world. You're only going to find that in Christ. Only Jesus can say, and I'll close with this, John eleven twenty five to 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Nobody else can say this but Jesus. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he says, do you believe this? Well, if you do, then eternal life is yours. If you believe that, then you know where you're going when you die. You know that God loves you. You know Jesus is alive in, in your life 
you know that you're going directly into heaven when you take your last breath here on earth. But if you're not sure, you don't know where you're going to go when you die, then I encourage you right now. There's four, here's an easy way to remember, four R's. First, the R is simply recognize. Recognize, if you don't know Jesus today, recognize you're a sinner. The Bible says we've all sinned. I was a great sinner <laughs> in a bad way. So are most of you. But recognize I'm a sinner. That simply means, but I need a Savior because I can't save myself. So recognize I'm a sinner and I've sinned against God. Then realize, that's the second R, God loves you. Realize God sent His only begotten Son, Jesus, into this world to die for you. And there's an old saying that I, I personally believe it's true. If you were the only person on planet Earth, Jesus still would have come from heaven to earth and die in your place. That's because He loves you as an individual. Yes, for God so loved the world, but He loves you. So realize that. He loves you. Jesus came to die for you and then simply receive Him. That's where you recognize, Lord, I realize I need your forgiveness and I want to receive you into my life as Lord and Savior. And when you do, He will wash away all of your sins. He will turn you into a new creation in Christ. He will give you meaning and purpose in this life. And when you do, then the fourth R is simply you can rejoice. You can rejoice knowing that he did what you could never do. You could live to be a million years old and you'll never get it figured out. You could live to be a million years old and you'll never be able to save yourself. You'll never be able to clean yourself up. We're sinners by nature. That means we were born sinners. And we're sinners by action. And you might say, well, I've never done a lot of bad stuff. That's okay. You're still a sinner because you were in Adam. Adam's sin, Adam and Eve's sin, was passed on to every human being, and that's why we need the Savior. Even if you're a little goody-two-shoes today, you need the Savior, Jesus Christ.